Welcome, Spartans, to Spartan Up the Podcast, the podcast dedicated to getting you ripped off the couch, getting you out and exercising daily so you can be a better Spartan. All right, today's show is a little bit special because we've got a special guest with us here today. We've got ex or former world championship rower or world champion rower, Josh Crosby. So Josh is here. Hi, guys. He's, he's joining us. We've got, as always, Joe DeSena over here to my left, CEO and founder of Spartan. Of course, I am retired Colonel Tim Nye. We're missing Sephra, the seed huntress, and Johnny Waite and Dr. L. They've all taken off and left us. But today's episode, we're going to be talking about um, a guy I, uh, I watched many, many times on TV, a real rugged individual, bad MF, MFer out there, the Dean of Mean, Keith Jardine. Yeah, I ran into him. I was at a conference, and he had a, uh, a cool knitted skull cap on, and he looked like a caveman. That's the first thing that entered my mind, and a bad, badass. Right, yeah. well, caveman in general would be badass, right? And, um, and I had to go. I was attracted to him. I had to go over and start talking to him, and I, I dove in. You know MMA a lot better than I do, Colonel Nye. I don't know how much you know about MMA, Josh. Uh, enough uh, to know that I wouldn't get in the ring because yeah. I'd get destroyed. And, and, and Joe, I know I watch it on TV. That, that's the extent of my knowledge. Yeah, so, so uh, I got over uh, to him, started talking to him. Turns out, as most MMA and uh, wrestling and combat sports uh, individuals, even the best of the best, they're really pretty humble, nice creatures. Even though they look like they're going to rip your head off. Yeah. For some reason, I don't know, maybe you've got something we can get into after we watch okay. the show. Yeah. But, but, um, I got some ideas. But anyway... He's going he's gonna to teach us how to pivot, right? right? And Actually, you pivoted in your a career. A few times. Yeah. I mean, you were a world champion rower, and then what happened? Uh, then I did not make the 2000 Olympic team, and I thought it was all over. I thought I was going to take a year off and, and maybe get back into it for the next cycle. And um, Well, don't tell. Don't yeah. give away too much. Totally, we're, we're, totally pivoted. Hard, hard, but hard, the point is hard to do. Yeah. And yeah. he's going to teach us a little bit on how to do that during this interview and who he is, where he came from, and how he got it done. All right, and stick with us through the uh, interview. When we get done, we're all going to come back and kind of chew it up a little bit and talk about some of the lessons that Keith uh, 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 put forth and then see how you can apply them to your own life. All right, we are here for Spartan Up Podcast, and we are drinking caveman coffee. I'm not even a coffee guy, and I'm pretty drawn to this can. It's pretty badass, and I'm drawn to this guy. Um, what's your story? Where'd you grow up? Man, um, I grew up in Oregon, actually, a really small town in Oregon. Really small. No movie theater, no uh, fast food restaurants, anything like that. Then I moved to L.A. with my dad in high school, and, and, and that was... On a farm in Oregon? <laughs> No, no, uh, in the middle of the town. And it was kind of reversed there. Like, um, we should think, like, the people that lived out in the farms, like, those are all the rich folks, the poor people folks lived in town. Got it, and, yeah, got it. Yeah, so but, you're, but you're a big guy. You remind, like, if I had to guess, your dad was a logger or a farmer or something? Miner. A miner, okay. I come from, uh, come from a real town. Well, half my family were miners, other half were loggers, so, so I got... Come and, and parents split at a young age? Yeah, yeah. Dad goes to L.A.? Yeah. When did, when did you leave um, to go with him? My freshman year of high school, and it was always my dream to live with my dad. Like, I always had a relationship with my dad, and, and finally my mom agreed to let me go then. And, and so I moved from small little town to big town in L.A., and I thought I was in the center of the universe there. And um, brothers, sisters? Older sister. Yeah. Cool. She yeah. moved too, or no? No, she stayed there. She stayed? Yeah, yeah. So you get yeah, that's to... That's an amazing story. I get into that another day. But, all right. Well, I'm you... one of the toughest people I know in my life. Yeah. <laughs> You get to L.A. and bright lights. Yeah. What are you thinking? Uh, I'm just like a little kid. Like, you know, and it, even then my dad was in a bad area, like, like a lot of, um, like, you know, a rough area. And, like, I don't know any better. Like, I'm, I remember going to practice with all my football gear and all this stuff. We're walking through, through bad neighborhoods and going across the, I forgot what they call it. There's a bridge I went to in the high school. You're not supposed to go across that bridge. I'm gonna go, and all these bad folks types playing handball, whatever. I didn't know any different. I'd walk back there, and people thought I was just this crazy white kid from Oregon. So there was, um, yeah, and yeah. football was the sport? Football and wrestling, man. Wrestling's what, what really did it for me. When did you start wrestling? I started wrestling in middle school in Oregon, which was, which that what gave me a lot of confidence in California. I was just this really shy, man, incredibly shy kid, like, 
didn't know any better. Um, even just that we just did this talk in public right now, man, like that would have killed me a long time ago. Anyways, it's really shy kid and and um, but I played football. I did pretty good in football, but then wrestling. I come from a background in wrestling where wrestling is a lot tougher in, in Oregon than California. And I remember uh, the big bully in the varsity football team. Like, like he, he plays, he wrestles too, and they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna pick on the new guy. And hey, Keith, let's get a match with you. You and uh, they called him Bob Moose at the time, I and mean, he looked like a Bob Moose. And and I took him down right away. Made him look pretty silly. How long had you been wrestling at that point? I started wrestling in fourth grade in Oregon. Oh, okay, yeah. you started young. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that was it. You had now you were uh, you were the man, the big man on campus. No, I was definitely not the man. I was still just a shy kid, couldn't talk to anybody, whatever. I was just the. But you had confidence. Uh, the confident, strange man that that nobody wanted to mess with. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. You know, my wife always says, "What our what our boys um, make sure they wear the, the the headgear. Make sure they wear the." Yeah. And I say, you know what? I say it's better that they have. That's screwed right. up ears because nobody will mess with them. That's right. And in fighting, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real thing, especially at the beginning when I was fighting. It was the beginning of, of, of the sport. Yep. If you see a guy that doesn't have messed up ears, like that guy hasn't put his time in. Like that, that's definitely. You, you got to see the bad ears. Yeah, it's definitely that, like metals. Yeah. So it's interesting because, um, I mean, obviously Pennsylvania wrestling yeah. is it or Iowa, right? And, and so you go to California, there's not much nah. going on there. So what'd you do? I got, I got. My first year in wrestling, I got second in city, wow. LA City, which wasn't one to. No, I got second and first the next year, and then that was it, man. All I, all I knew how to do was train for sports and, and all that, and watch movies and hang out with my dad. That that was that was life for me. That was that. Yeah. When did you start working? I got football scholarship to move to New Mexico. Really, another small. Now I'm back to a small town again. I go to northern New Mexico to play football. I went to a junior college in LA, and I went to. Uh, the rest of my college in northern New Mexico, a small little school, and um, yeah, so 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 I got my degree in human performance there, and nice. and, and, and I'm playing football. I end up being coaching the football. I was a defensive coordinator there at the college, probably the youngest defensive coordinator in in the country at that time. I was a co-defensive coordinator, and uh, so you're smart too. Um, uh, I mean, you did that at a young age. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, but. And there was a point, that's what led me to, I, I remember, I think it was my third year of coaching, and I was still really young, and I felt like I, I still had to be an athlete, and I was watching my, my linebackers move and set up, and I was almost like a jealousy of them, not not the bad toxic jealousy, just like, like it's still something in me, and then, but then I started getting into bar fights again, well, not really, and then, like, picking fights, like, it's not really my personality. Yeah, but, why, why do you think you were picking fights? I think just that that outlet, that testosterone, that yeah. um, there's other reasons too. I mean, it's a confidence thing too, right? You want to prove something. Yeah, yeah. I've always had to, coming from a small town, coming from nothing, coming from whatever, and, and not being um, very verbal. I always had to prove something. Like I'm not going to talk my way. I'm not going to talk you down. There's a, there's only one chance I got. Sure. <laughs> so. So yeah, so. How long did it take to realize that that was not the ideal path? Well, it didn't take me that long. I, I one night, like I picked a fight with a guy for no reason at all, and and and, and, and you know did well in that. And then the next day, um, actually, it was the day before a football game. The next day, I was at around the football field, and and my friends were playing in a rugby game. There's a rugby thing. And then, like, yeah, man, I got to do something. They, ask me, they always ask me if I wanted to play, and absolutely, I want to play. So I got into rugby, and then, and then. Uh, You're built like a rugby player. Yeah, they always said, <laughs> to get get the ball and run forward, and yeah. I can do that, man. And then, so that got it out. And then, so then I realized I needed to be doing something. And at the same time, the other football coaches thought I was crazy because I would just show up, and I don't know why, I just knew I had to do it. I would go to. Colorado Springs, I'd drive up there and, and go up to these amazing r wrestling tournaments, like World Class, the Dave Schultz Memorial Tournament, uh, oh. where all the Olympic teams are there. Sure. And I would just show up and wrestle at these tournaments unattached. And they'd, uh, they'd have like so and so versus the, uh, from the Ukraine versus this bum over here is unattached. And you know, I wouldn't do very well. You do well? well. No. Oh. No. I would, but I just needed to compete. And all the other football coaches thought I was crazy driving up there doing this thing. Um, but wrestling was in you. 
Yeah, just that fight. I needed. I don't. Know, I guess I had to prove something inside myself. I had to let something out. I, I, yeah. Um, it just. And that leads to MMA. Yeah. Yeah. Where How I, old were you when, when that started? Man, I'm, I don't even like to think about age. I was. I was started late. I was in my late twenties, twenty eight, something okay. around there. So, so there's a guy in the local rec center that um, I would actually use that. I would use his people to to help me train for uh, wrestling for those tournaments. Sure. And uh, he was actually trained under Greg Jackson, which is a big trainer. And this is around 99, 2000. Okay. He was a big trainer in in, Cal in, in Albuquerque, New Mexico at that time. But still, the sport's so young. Anyway, I trained with one of his disciples. Started beating him right away. And, and like, I really have a knack for this. And I always had a dream of mine from like watching blood sport and all these things. Like, what would it be like to to uh, actually fight people in competition, like be a Rocky, you know? It'd be, and yeah. I always had, a, always kind of had a, I wanted to be a boxer, I wanted to fight, I wanted to test myself that way. And more than more than wrestling, something a little more aggressive. Yep, yep. Yeah. No, no rules. And, yeah. And, and, and that feeling just to step into a fight, I wanted to know what that like. Like it's easy, like, uh, like talking about a bar, someone disrespects you or over sure. there. Sure. Sure. You're whatever. provoked. Yeah. But as opposed it's to easy to get up and go out. Right. Like, you don't have to think about it. Um, but then to, to do all that and fight somebody else that's training to fight you and do that whole thing and walk up and do it in front of all your mates. The camaraderie might have a lot to do with it, too. Fighting in front of your mates and, and showing off in front of you, the old man, that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, could be. Anyway. Right, something to prove. Yeah, exactly. I always had something to prove. And then, so, yeah, so, so then I moved up to, to Greg. I, I met Greg Jackson once. And, um... And so that's it. I'm gonna move to California and get this. This I'm done with coaching. I'm, I'm gonna give this uh, fighting thing a go for a year, and I'll do that or join the military. It was one or the other to pay off my student loans. And so I'll give this thing for a year. Maybe I'll, then I'll join the military later. And then a year became two years, became three years, and we gonna fight. Where, well, where was the first fight? Whew, my first. Oh yeah, <laughs> my first fight was in Denver, Colorado. Um, Winklejohn got me that fight. Um, Mike Winklejohn, if MMA fans will know who he is. Um, I was training with Greg, going to grappling turns, doing a lot of jiu-jitsu, doing that thing. I won, won some good grappling tournaments. And, 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 uh, can we cuss Denver. on this? <laughs> yeah, you uh, say anything about that. Well, like, shit, shit, shit or get off yeah. the pot. Like, yeah. I know this friend's promoting a fight in Denver, and he's looking for a matchup for this guy, and I'm going to fight this guy. What size is he? Is he your size? It's 205. The weight right. is 205. And, yeah. and, and he fought in Pride before, and he's, he's a pretty well-known guy. They'd bring me and get beat up by this. So you are Rocky this in this case. That's Apollo yeah, yeah, Creed. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Right. And, and um, you trained? You ready? Yeah, I'm trained. Oh, I can take this further. Um, I trained. I'm ready. I tore my road, uh, not my rotator cuff. Uh, I separated my my collarbone tr like three weeks before the fight. And back then, like it's still a fight. Like I'm gonna go do the fight. Like. I tried to do a push up. I only ran the last three weeks. All I could do was run. And even because you're because you're shoulder. I had to have my arm in my pocket. <laughs> so you're going in with a bad shoulder. Yeah, I tried to do a push up for the first time that morning. Couldn't do it. So I find this guy named Amir Renavardi, and, and, and he's a really well known guy. The guy's kid, Rutten, Bash Rutten's protege, and Bash Rutten's like 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 a big star then from from, from Japan and stuff. And, and so so I go take him down, arm bar him right away, break his arm, turn his arm backwards, and and, and won that fight. And and um, he, I, I forgot. I think he might have got paid a few thousand for that fight. I got paid two hundred for that fight. A hundred dollars to show up. Hundred dollars to to wins. I got paid two hundred dollars for that fight. How'd you feel? I thought it was amazing. I bought everybody dinner. Nice. I, <laughs> With the two hundred bucks. Yep, yep. I thought nice. it was greatest, man. Because, because we fought back then. That's what's cool. There's a whole generation. The reality show hit, and people made made it really big, and and became like now people want to be like the next John Jones. They want to be the next superstar. And, and there it was a lot more raw record. when you when you went in. We just wanted to fight, you know. We wanted to fight other people trained to fight, and, and we saw too many movies and, and too much samurai stuff and all that, and we wanted to do that, and, and that's all it was about for us back then. And let's take let's take um, let's take a break. Why don't you and I go fight? Okay. And we'll come back and finish this up. Oh, let's see how it goes. All right. I hope you're not sitting still while you listen. If you are, you better get a burpee break in. Dude, you're a lot tougher than I am. <laughs> <laughs> you got me, I'm, man. I'm, it hurts. I'm, I'm psyched you didn't break my arm. Yes. Yeah, so, so you you win that fight. You buy everybody dinner. Then what? This is your new life. Ah, man. Really? What, where are we at there? Um, 
You know, I'm just I'm I'm super proud. Um, uh, there's another fights happening in Albuquerque, and and fighting is so raw then in big arenas. I remember, and still like, I remember just being in the hometown, everybody being in the ring and everybody chanting my name, Keith, Keith, Keith. That was such a big deal for me, man. Like I'm really doing. I'm not making any money, and no, the, there's UFC is barely a sport back then, and. It was still raw, like it's we said. So yeah. we're still doing that thing. Yeah. Then I fight overseas a couple times. I fight in Japan, and, and these are amazing stories I like to tell sometimes. How, yeah, no, tell me, tell me. How'd you do in Japan? Um, well, almost you like that. You land in Japan. You nervous? Heck yeah. Almost like the first fight. Like the, whenever they bring you somewhere to fight somewhere else, especially in those days, they bring you in to lose. Yeah. Um, and and I, I land in Japan three days before my fight. Which you're is you're a gimme, in other words. You're, exactly. You're, they're yeah. just throwing you in the yeah, ring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm fighting the former king, former Pancrase champion. Right. Um, he, he's a well-known Japanese guy. And and so I land there, and I'm having trouble with a new weight class. It's 198. I've never made 190. I've been 198 since, I don't know, my first year of high school. Wow. And so then they change, they change everything. All oh, first of all, we're only there three days before, which is short. Then they, then we get the oh oh by the way, we change weigh-ins because we got to go to Osaka to fight. We change weigh-ins to the day of the fight, which is pretty unheard of. It's always the day before, you have 24 hours to recover. Sure. So then my whole. You think they were fucking with you? Or? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. It, it just it's what what they do. Set up because this guy yeah. had to win. They knew that the whole time. And, right. Yeah yeah. And. And so my whole my whole experience of when I first got there was pretty much cutting weight, <laughs> and so no sushi. Yeah, I didn't really eat any good food. My trainer did, and I I, I made him eat a lot of stuff. Greg Jackson, I eat that, eat that, eat that. Tell me how that is. Tell me how that is. <laughs> and then so I spent the whole day before the fight cutting weight all day long, and then the next morning I wake up, I'll cut the rest. I cut all morning. I, I cut on the train all the way there. I get to the fight. I miss the first weigh in. Um, I'm pound over. Fuck. Yeah, and and then so like. Did they we, give you, they give you more time or? Well, it was about two hours before the fight, I think, maybe two and a half. Yeah. It was really close when we weighed in before the fight. It's a weird event it's in the hotel. Yeah. It's, it's not like normal fights, and and so I made a steam room out of my bathroom, turned the the the, the shower, shower on, on yeah. and steam room, and and and, and a random place there and lost, lost the, the extra pound. pound. I, st I uh, like an hour hour and twenty minutes before my fight, I step on scale, made weight. So now, what'd you eat? Yeah, that's the thing. Is um, what can you eat? You're gonna fight. You don't want to yeah. fall. I just remember laying there on the ground. I'm here in Japan. I have no energy. My body's just drained. Like, how am I gonna do this? What's gonna? Oh, I gotta walk out in front of all these people and do this fight. And then my buddy. Well, he's my buddy now. I didn't know him. Nate Marquardt, another well-known fighter. He was he was fighting too. He brought me some some. Uh, was that stuff, a uh, Pedialyte or something yeah, like that? Sure. Yeah. yeah. So I drank a little bit of that, a little bit of that, more of that, and and it's just like I remember laying there. I remember feeling my like left leg first, and I remember did it my left leg. First. Oh, oh, there's a little bit of energy. Oh my God. And then and then the, and the, there's a little bit of energy, and then and, the, and it built up until I did a lightest warm up because I, I didn't have any energy to spend. I walk out to the fight. My face, you can see on the video, like my face is all Thanks. sucked in. Sure. I go out to the fight and and and, and I fight their form, and then they was messing with you. I remember I, I, they announced me first in the ring. I'm standing in the ring. It took him maybe 10, maybe 15 minutes to come out to the locker room just because they're they're trying to. Yeah, they're trying, psyched yeah. out. Yeah, I tell my kids. I say you don't have to go out to the mat in the circle first. Wait, yeah. let him stand out there. That's right. Right. Be relaxed. I did, yeah. yeah. And, anyway, so I get out there and we do the fight and. Maybe a little bit anticlimactic because it was a draw. I didn't lose a fight. I, I had a All draw right. with that former king. Take a draw. Yeah. And then How did you feel? Felt amazing, man. Um, then I got to experience, experience Japan. Um, uh, everybody was so beat, they went to bed, and, and I just walked around Japan until almost till sun up, uh, going to little bars, having sake. That it's a crazy stuff. place. I just awesome. lived there for a year. It's a crazy place. I really want to go back just to enjoy it. Whenever you want to go, I got a whole bunch of friends there. Yeah. So, yeah. Whenever you want to go. Yeah. My fiance fights in the UFC now too. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so so I did that one, and then then I fought in, in Russia, which is another crazy experience, and I won that fight against the guy they brought me in to lose. Their super, I super, I armbarred him too in the nice. first round, nice. and that was like the crowd going crazy for him, booing me when I come out, 
and then my, my, all my best wins seem to be this way, and then just dead silent after I onboard them. Because they don't, because they don't know who you are. Yeah. So you, I mean, you really are like the real life Rocky of MMA, uh, right? This bad boy, unknown. If you count, if 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 you, uh, I, I was, I was like that. I never thought about it before, but. It, Maybe Rocky won where he didn't win the title. <laughs> it's close. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I beat, I've beaten a lot of champs in my day. I've beaten Chuck Liddell. I've beaten Forrest Griffin. I, I've beaten a lot of the big names, but they never had the butt title when I beat them. Got it. So, so I, I did that fight, and then, then I got called onto the reality show, which was definitely not my personality. I didn't want to do it. Like that seemed like death to me to be on a reality show, and, but, but if that's what it takes to to have a career in this sport. I'm going to do did it. it. Because yeah. season one was success, and I was on season two, and that got me in the UFC. And, nice. And, and then, then you had a good run. Had a good run. I had some. I tell people I have some of the most spectacular wins, like the ones I've described. Like when I beat Chuck Liddell, it was a similar situation. We turned the crowd, that kind of thing, and people hated me at first and loved me afterwards. That went out. Bonner was the same way. And Forrest Griffin. One of my favorite fights of all time was Quentin Jackson. I lost that fight, but still one of my favorite fights of all time. And and just because it was, it was why, like, man, it was back and forth. I, I was just surviving the whole time. We were just fighting, man, and 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 I didn't know if I was winning. I didn't know if I was losing. I just knew I was surviving, and and and, and I, I got to keep attacking, or else he's going to attack me back. And it was like that. And Quentin's told me too is one of his favorite fights. And then it gets what, to yeah. The, what did he say at the end of the fight to you? That he told he said, me. Well, actually, I ran into him years later. Yeah. He, he told me one of his favorite Just fights battle. he had and you're a real warrior and all that stuff and I really really respect that I, I got knocked down in the last 10 seconds of the fight that's what lost me the fight one of the judges came up to me and said I had you winning before that which I had no idea where I was in the fight so I knew there was 10 seconds left I gotta go for it man because this is my only chance and then he clicked me with something I fell down on my knees and came back up and it lost me the fight yeah but whatever I don't you care play about that, all you that. play that tape or you're cool no I'm cool with that because yeah. I fought the fight I yeah. lost to Vandalay Silva got knocked out in the first uh I don't know, first minute of the fight, I don't even know. We right. ne I, never, I, I never fought him. I just, I zigged when I should have zagged and got caught on the chin, and that was it. And so I still don't know what it's like to fight that legend of the sport, you know sure. what I mean? Sure, sure. So that's all about the fight for me. I never cared about the titles or anything. I just wanted to, to get in that fight that the fans loved and all that. What so um, I was saying to you, I had the most spectacular wins and those most spectacular losses at the same yeah. time. No, it's good. It's yeah. good. What's um, from there? Caveman Coffee? Yeah, um, as, as, as I said in that talk we just did, um, um, I dropped down to the dumbest thing I've ever done is I thought that, well, I fought everybody in my weight class, so maybe I'll try 185 and, and that'll make people interested in me fighting again. I'll get back into the UFC that way. And so I, I lost a lot of weight to fight at 185 and, and I, even my diet that wasn't great as it was got a lot more I accentuated that and now I'm running every day just to lose weight I'm, not, I'm training just to lose weight not even fight and I became I came a walking old man and I fought two fights that weren't um, they weren't even I don't even count them as fights and, and it's they, because you were an unhealthy weight I couldn't move man yeah. I couldn't move yeah. and, and the last one was a guy that I matched up really well against and my coach told me that I needed to, to think about retiring because I, I took a pretty good pounding against this guy, and, yeah. and uh, again, I, I, just, I physically couldn't, I couldn't move, I couldn't react, and and then that led into a period of my life where, like, what am I going to do now? I've always dreamt of acting, and, and that's what I want. I know that's what I want to do, but physically, like, I, I feel like death, and and, and I, I'm walking in a coma every day, and and um, I'm, I'm I'm depressed about money. I'm losing all this money flying out to LA for auditions and trying to make this career work and I'm, I went through all my savings and all that trying to make this acting thing work wow. trying to make that happen and and then I met Tate at an audition my partner Tate Fletcher and um, he starts telling me about how are you feeling how's your diet and all that and he's asked me about that before but this time I'm definitely ready to listen and then then he starts telling me about paleo diet and gives me um, Mark's book and, 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 and Rob Wolf's book and, and and I, and I dive into that, and it's the most freeing thing I've ever done in my life. And, and, and it's just like. Just gave up sugar? I gave up sugar, and, and I learned how to fast. I learned how to be in control of my food. Right. And, and also, like, I'm a foodie, man, but I learned how to enjoy food more than I've ever enjoyed food in my life. 
I, I remember when I talked about diet, they always say like I, I like they're special. They love food more than the next person or whatever. You don't love food for more than me. I promise you that. Yeah. And so I learned how to control it and how to enjoy it and how to eat within certain parameters and and I became more healthy. People, I go into practice now and, and, and I'll beat up you people fighting in the UFC right now without even training. Just because of your diet. Just because I'm healthier. Yeah. I'm healthier yeah. than I was and, and, yeah. and a lot of this, the, the stuff kind of stuck with me as far as training and. Anyway, anyway, that what was the question? How that turned into coffee? Well, that, and that leads to coffee. Yeah, because and then me and Tate, me and Tate. Now I'm just going around telling everybody that'll listen about. I have yoga studio too, and I'll, I'll sit with people for for a long time after class when they ask me about diet and and and, 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 and like I'm not an expert, but this, this is my path. This will lead me somewhere. Now, now I'm trying to get tell everybody to go do your own research and find it out. But it's all out there. Sure. And, and here, here's where you need to look. And, and um, so I'm preaching that and and. and and Tate already has a coffee business. I found a coffee bean that, that we really that that was unique, and and, and we started selling that almost a, a, as a way to promote what we're talking about. Like I don't know, they both fed off each other, and, and that grew into like a hobby that we're selling coffee and we're showing up to. The, it's cool because it got me in the room with people like you, and, and it got me in the Paleo FX meeting Mark Sishin and Rob Wolf, and now I'm meeting all these people that, that, that helped change my life. You had an actual product. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Now, yeah. now we're in the conversation. Yeah. And then now recently the product's actually gaining wheels and momentum and because a couple of things we, we did with our suppliers and things and changing the product and, and all that. And, and now it's like, now it's a real business. Now it's like, uh-oh, how, how do we keep up with this thing? Yeah, now, yeah. You're, yeah, now you're pregnant. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. For, with triplets. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm psyched that you spent the time with me. I'm glad you didn't break my arm. I'm excited to try some coffee. Yeah, so now do I got now do I got to run a race with you? Now you got to run a race with me. We're gonna oh, do a geez. race. Um, where do you live right now these days? Albuquerque, New Mexico. Perfect. I'm yeah. gonna get you to a race. And we're gonna be high altitude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It'll even out a little bit. We'll go uphill somewhere. All no right. problem. You're the man. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Uh, what do you think? Well, I think he is exactly what you think he is, right? I mean, his persona is out of the ring, pretty much what it is in. Well, I'll take that back. I mean, he's not aggressive outside the ring. But, I mean, just looking at the guy, uh, he looks like a guy that um, you might want to walk around or walk on the other side of the street. Uh, I mean, he looks like a tough guy, and he is a tough guy. Yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't mess with him. But surprisingly, you go, to, you go to shake his hand. I spent time with him. I actually flew to Japan with him. And he's, he's pretty humble. He's pretty grounded like a lot of the fighters we meet. It well, seems to, like, when I watch them on TV, that, that that humble side seems to come out almost instantaneously after some of these fights where they beat the crap out of each other and then they're hugging each other at the end, really genuine handshakes, and it, it blows my mind how... You just, you just yeah. you drop all that Yeah, they drop and that. They're, they're, they go into the, the ring and battle it out, and then they're professional. No, I can't say all of them, but they're professional and, and pretty humble. Were you like uh, that in rowing? Oof. Uh, yeah, I mean, when you're on the water and you're in the middle of a race, it's a completely different thing than afterwards. And a lot of times you might race against someone in college, but then end up being their teammate on the national team in the summer. So y you gotta, you gotta watch it. You might be pulling for them and they may be pulling for you come that summer when it comes up for the tryout. So you gotta, gotta be respectful. Military like that? Well, it is, but I, I yes. Uh, but let me just back up a little bit. I, I think that humility part comes out a little bit more so in individual sports than probably team sports. You know, you see a lot, if you watch a football game at any level, you see a lot of the trash talk back and forth, and it's actually even encouraged, right? Or at least by the uh, sportscasters and, and a lot of the fans. But on an individual one-on-one -on -one sport, listen, when you walk across a, a mat or you shut that, that door on an octagon, you don't know. I mean, Mike Tyson got beat, right? I mean, you you might just get your ass kicked that day, so you might as well just be humble. I, I have seen in college wrestling now they're starting to promote a little bit more of the trash talking, and, and it never used to exist, uh, but they're trying to make it more popular. But I think that humility comes out because, okay, I, I just did my best, and you just kicked my ass. I mean, what do you expect me to yeah. do? Get jump up and, and down and the other and thing is you, you, you can't hide behind the team. Right. And I think a lot of times on the field, you can be a, a total jackass and then go kind of get behind the lineman or something right. like that. Uh, absolutely. It's a little different. And then when you asked me about the military, I was thinking as you were talking, I mean, 
professional militaries from the dawn of time have respected one another, uh, even unprofessional, meaning, you know, you don't have to be a foreign military. Uh, you know, I mean, we've been at war now with uh, al-Qaeda, Taliban, ISIS, whatever, for, what, 19 years now. I mean, there are some hardcore fighters there, and you'd be foolish not to think so, right? So you can you can respect them and still go to war with them, shoot them, kill them, whatever. doesn't mean there's hatred. You, you're not, you don't need that. You're fighting, and you can respect your enemy. Respect the enemy. I think that I think that's what we learned here with Keith. The other thing is pivoting. You've had to pivot out of the military career. Yes. Well, uh, yeah, I had to. That's a good way of putting it. There, I said, "Hey, 32 years, man, you got to go." You know, they kind of kicked me out. No, I'm how, just kidding, how, well, but, I mean, how hard is that? Well, it's very hard, especially the longer the longer you put into something. I think probably the harder it is to leave, or maybe even the more attachment you have to it. Right? I mean, in the military. Everybody taps out sooner or later. It's just a matter of when it happens, right? It, it, so it's so it's coming, and you know it's coming. So I think maybe if you're a professional athlete, uh, you know, one day you're on top of the world, the next day you hurt your elbow and you need Tommy John surgery, and you, you're not playing anymore. That may be a tougher transition. How about you, Josh? You uh, yeah, you- mine was pretty quick. I mean, I had the uh, in the back of my head that I could take a year off and then maybe jump into the next cycle, but. I was already, you know, 10 years into serious training and racing, and it's it's hard once you've had a few, uh, you know, defeats and, and kind of a, a fall from, I mean, I was on the team four years, and then I didn't make it. That's that's a real blow. Um, but uh, I, I did take some time off, and then I shifted into some other stuff, and that's, I ch- took my energy, my, my, my talent, my uh, hard work, my fitness, mental strength, everything, and then channeled it into... How, but how many how many people can't do that, right? I, I had a pivot uh, from Wall Street, but it was an easier pivot. I had made some money. And so you could, right? I, it's an easier pivot. But I don't know if it is easier because you had to leave something you were doing for a long time and also do something like, drastically different. So money or no money. I, yeah, but ha- having money gave you Makes it easier. some security. Yeah. But I don't think making money, I don't know, you tell me if I'm wrong, was that your goal? If it was, well, you'd, I, still, I, you'd still be. No, no, no. My, I wanted to make a, a number. I wanted to make some money so that I, I wouldn't fight with my family the way I saw my dad and my mom fight. So I had a goal there. Uh, you wanted to make the Olympic team. I don't know what your goal was in the military. Yeah, you wanted to be a either. general. I don't even part of the problem. Well, that's interesting what you're saying there, right? Because um, I'm sure Keith had on, you know, he, he, he had his yeah, mindset listen, on. I, I started as a private and worked my way up to sergeant. I had no no aspirations ever of being a colonel. I mean, that was so far, you know. I remember at one point making a phone call, and I was talking to the headquarters up in the Pentagon, you know, and they said, look, you have to leave the job you're in. And I said, why? And they said, well, if you stay there, you'll never make colonel. And I remember laughing on the phone and said, did you ever think that was a goal of mine? I could care less about that. Well, it happened anyway, right? But, I mean, so I, I, well, so I that's, needed a job. I had one. That's a big question for us then in the audience that I'd like to pose, which is, um, you know, for the last four years, we've talked th- about this idea of uh, setting a goal, etching it in stone, right, um, chanting that mantra. So you get to where you're planning on going. But but should we or uh, because because if your goal was so finite towards getting on that Olympic team and, get, and then you don't, are you? You know, I think it depends on your DNA. Right. So um, there's plenty of people who who, you know, weren't able to pivot maybe or they weren't willing to take that risk that would really allow them to find something on the next uh, path that was as fulfilling and full of passion and whatnot. So I don't know. But some people are okay with going as hard as they can and then shutting down. And, And that's okay too, in some ways, if they're happy. How do you want to? How do you you want to ask the audience? Maybe they can come back to us because. Well, you know, it's that it, when you were talking, I was thinking it's that old thing about if you have a goal without a plan, it's just a dream, you know. So there's a little bit difference there between setting a goal, an actual aspiration, and just kind of well, my dream one day is to be the world champion, right? But I'm sure you had a plan, a set of yeah, and the plan out, the plan know. would change though. Yeah, right. Yeah. Some subsets and everything else. But but the is there a plan B? It's another thing we talk about. No plan B. And so all I'm saying is if you put everything into it, which is our mantra, that's what we say. Right. Put everything into it. Don't don't do anything that won't make the boat go faster. And then all of a sudden the boat springs a leak a leak. 
and you and you have focused on anything else, like <laughs> you got to swim to shore. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know how to yeah, swim. But <laughs> I think again, if your goal is to be the best you can be, that's it. You know, I mean. And if you got to so pivot, if you, you take it out world champion out of the title and say, I want to be the very best rower I can be, as opposed to being the best rower in the world. You make that a whole lot more obtainable, and a lot more. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? If you don't make it, you. you well, you're going to make it because you know, yeah, you're going to yeah, know yeah. whether you yeah. try it hard enough I like or not. what you just said a lot because I never set out to be a world champion. I became one because I was so focused on right. being the best I possibly could be every I stroke and right, every Colonel day. All right, Colonel and I nailed the end. I, I like that, right? I'm, I'm, I'm going to be the we best. still ask everybody in the audience what they think about it. Send their comments back to us. Contact us. And, again, if we like what you said, maybe you know, obviously we'll post it, but maybe one day we'll have you on the show. By the way, if you are on the show, we show up in the middle of the night with a black van. We zip tie That's the hands what behind, to me. <laughs> and you just show up in an undisclosed warehouse, which is where we are now. They left me actually for about sixty days. That gave me the hair growth and the, and the yeah beard. and the beard. So catch you I later. Was clean cut. We want to hear from you. Tell me what you're applying, what you're not applying, what you're struggling with. Go to our Instagram account and be part of the conversation. Let's change the world together.